Welcome back to our puppet show. Joss, the purple-eared puppy. Sue, the pink-eared puppy. Hey, Sue, guess what happened to me at Walmart? Well, Joss, I don't see how anything could possibly happen to you at Walmart. You never go to Walmart. You don't like Walmart. You are afraid of Walmart. And the last time we were at the bank near Walmart, you got the shakes just from being in their parking lot. Oh, okay. Actually, this happened to one of our viewers. She was in Walmart, and she was on her way out, and someone stopped her and asked if they could have her receipt, and they checked her bags, and she felt like she was being treated like a shoplifter. Well... That's probably because she was being treated like a shoplifter. Well, what should she have done? Well, I can't tell her what she should have done. But interestingly enough, the same thing happened to me last month. I was approached by a very timid and obsequious Walmart greeter who wanted my receipt and wanted to go through my bags. Okay, wait a sec. Obsequious. Can that be our word of the day? Sure, you want to define it? Yeah. Obsequious. It's from the Latin, and it means cringing and servile. Originally, the word only meant compliant. Yeah, like when somebody asks you to do something, and you say, yeah, sure. There were no judgments or no derogatory associations at first, but over the centuries, it came to mean cringing, groveling, servile. So that's our word for the day. So what happened when the Walmart clerk asked you to see your receipt? Well, how about we save that until after the intro? Was it really embarrassing? If I had been there, would I have wanted to hide somewhere? Oh, probably. But if you had your camera, you would have gotten a great video. <laughs> I have my camera now. You want to go to Walmart? Sure, we'll stop at Starbucks on the way. Okay, when we get back, we are going to talk about what happens, what are your options, if someone stops you at the door and says, you can't leave until you show me what's in your cart. And we're also going to talk about our contest winners, we have two contest winners to discuss, and our hands-on project of the day is here, restoring chalkware lamps. And this video was done at the request of one of our viewers, so obviously some of you are interested in this. It's relatively easy, and we're going to take a look at that. So we will be right back. Stay tuned. <laughs> store and the elderly Walmart reader says may I see your receipt I need to search your bags what do you do well what would you do if I walked up to you at Walmart and said hey can I see your receipt you'd say no anyone would say no you can certainly refuse they're asking you a question do they have the legal right to search your bag if you're simply walking out of the store no, no one does. Um, even the police need probable cause to conduct a search. And if you're not shoplifting and you haven't behaved in some strangely suspicious way that would lead someone to believe you might be shoplifting, if all you've done is just checked out your goods and you're walking out the store, no, they don't have the right to search you. Sometimes, however, you have said yes to the search without realizing it. For example, if you go into one of those big box stores, the kind where you have to fill out an application and you get a little membership card, 
there's probably a paragraph in that application form somewhere that grants the store the right to search your bags because they all do it on the way out. In that case, you've already agreed. So do they have the right? Yes, but only because you voluntarily gave it to them. Sometimes you'll walk into a, um, a store, antique malls and flea markets are real big on this, and there'll be a sign on the door and the sign will say, we reserve the right to search your bags. Well, if you walk through the door and shop at that store after having passed that sign and presumably read and understood it, you've surrendered your right. You have, in effect, said, yes, I agree with this, and I accept your terms, and I'll shop with that, that understanding that you're going to search my bags, or at least that you may search my bags. I'm giving you permission. But that's the key. They're asking for your permission which you can grant or withhold at your discretion. The easiest way out of it, of course, is to just hand them the receipt and be done with it. But I don't do that. Um, in part, I don't do that because I was born for confrontation, but also because it's my privacy rights. Um, and for me, they're usually asking for a little bit more than they realize because I don't bring a handbag into these stores. I bring my own grocery bags and I will throw my wallet and my cell phone and my keys and whatever into one of the grocery bags, which is in effect acting as my handbag. So when they say, I want to search your bag, they're basically saying, I want to rifle through your purse. And the answer to that is absolutely not. So this is your choice. Um, if you say no, it is possible but unlikely that they will call the police. If they do call the police, you're certainly not going to get arrested. You haven't done anything wrong. Um, they can't hold you against your will either. And that is the key. This is all voluntary. People submit to searches voluntarily all the time. Personally, I think it's a very, very bad idea. Um, our privacy rights in general are predicated by our reasonable expectation of privacy. And the more privacy you give away, but the lower your reasonable expectation of privacy is going to be. Therefore, the fewer your privacy rights. That's my theory. But we did get that complaint from one of our viewers and thought it was worth addressing. So. What we're discussing today is chalkware lamps. Here we have this one and this one. You may remember these lamps from our show on how to choose a lampshade. And I had both these lamps out. Uh, they were really in pretty shabby shape. I mean, both of them pretty much looked like this one. And one of our viewers had written in and asked for information on dealing with chalkware lamps. And so that's essentially what this video is about. But we have a couple of little housekeeping things to clear up. And one of them is I want to announce the winner of our Name Lee No Shade contest. And that's Shannon Booth. And her winning entry was up and over. Uh, very simple very much to the point, short, easy to remember. I love the clever way she used the N as, as an abbreviation for and. And the shade goes up onto a pendant lamp and over the bulb. Very simple. Um, we got a lot of just really outstanding entries. Um, one of my favorites, by the way, which I, I actually wrote this down so I didn't mess it up, from Fill Your Bucket, and this is ubiquitous non-obstructing optiluminator, which I thought was wonderful. On the other hand, you really do need to write that down to remember it because that is just chock full of 50 cent words. So Shannon's prize, which is the Bosaware Swan Lamp, is as we speak winging its way out to Washington State, where she's from, and Jess Baylog, who was the winner of our steampunk contest, that was the gift certificate to Cogsworth Gears to Jewels. She has already gotten in touch 
with the Etsy shop. She's made her selections. Um, I have pictures of some of the things that she's selected, but I'd much rather she actually have it in her hands before I start sharing that. So we'll save that for next week. Um, I, I was impressed. She made some marvelous choices, and I'm looking at this thinking, oh, I need new earrings now. So that was our contest news. So let's start looking at this. Now I'm going to pop this one out of the way. The good thing about having a pair of lamps is we have a before and after built right in. This lamp, oh, here's our painting water. That's not drinking water, by the way. That's painting water. This lamp a few days ago looked like this one. Um, it has been um, repaired. There were a couple of minor blemishes in the plaster work. It has been repainted. It has been rewired because these didn't even have the same sockets. Um, one had an in and out socket like this, another had a pull chain, one had a black wire, one had a brown wire, and frankly, I wasn't convinced they were properly wired in the first place. So that was necessary too. Now, what we, what we want to talk about here is what is a chalkware lamp? What is chalkware? Because they're not all lamps, they're chalkware figurines. And what they are is basically molded plaster. That's the essence. Sometimes it's molded gypsum, but mostly it's plaster. And that's what this is. This is a piece of plaster. Let me show you on this one. So it's hollowed out. Um, they just poured plaster into a mold. And this is what came out. Now, chalkware lamps were a really big thing in the mid-century. Not all of them are mid-century modern. A lot of them are really strongly deco in feel, but these, this set in particular is very mid-century modern because of the subject matter. Um, these are, um, let us call them Nubian obelisks. Obelisks. Oh. Nubian odalisks. There we go. I was mixing obelisk and odalisk, and that doesn't mix well. Uh, Nubian odalisks, basically African slave women. Um, a lot of these lamps were, um, were created from uh, disparate cultural images. Uh, Asian, uh, Hawaiian, uh, African in this case. Um, for the most part, I find them to be racially offensive. I can't say that about these pieces. Um, when I really started looking at them when I was repairing them, I was very impressed by how beautiful these women are. Um, very African looking, very beautiful. So. Despite the fact that I think the subject matter, you know, a harem slave, is probably essentially offensive all by itself, the way they depicted the women is not, at least not to my eye. I thought they did an excellent job. I thought they were lovely, especially coming from a time when minorities were often depicted as caricatures and stereotypes. I've seen a lot of lamps of uh, Asians that just... I wouldn't want to own them. They're just too insensitive. But these, I don't know. I actually like these. Now, if you have uh, a chalkware lamp or a chalkware figurine that needs repair, the very first thing you need to do is make sure it is not one of those exceptionally valuable pieces. Um, and some of them are, especially the pieces from the 19th century, Make sure it's not an exceptionally valuable piece. If it's, a, if it's a common, ordinary, crude piece like this, and you can tell from the painting that it's crude, go ahead, repair it, restore it. If it's valuable, no. Make sure a professional takes a look at it. But this, oh, and when I say a professional, I mean someone who specializes in chalkware. 
because this is a very specific area of antiques and unless you really know it, you can go wrong very quickly and very easily. But if it's something like this, an ordinary lamp, um, yeah, repair it. In this case, if you take a look at this, and I am going to show you some close-up pictures, you'll see I pretty much have nothing to lose by restoring this. It's in bad shape. And as you can see, especially from the back, look how poorly it was painted the first time around. This was not fine art. It is not fine art. art now. It never was. So it's not one of those rare and valuable pieces you have to worry about restoring. So I'm going to show you how. Now the first thing I want to do is I want to insert a few pictures. The first picture you're going to see is of this lamp when it was cleaned but had not had anything done to it. So that's the one coming up now. Okay, the next picture is this same lamp after I covered over the cracks on the body. And these are superficial cracks, they don't go through. But I covered them over with a plaster slurry to fill them in. And there was a crack on the shoulder that I wanted to fill in a little better. So that's just all slopped over with plaster. So that's the next picture you're going to see. Here's the plaster. This is the repair. This is the plaster I used. I grabbed a little plastic box. I stuck my finger in a big tub of spackle. I put a little into my little box here. And look at that, it's hardening. Here's the great thing about it. I just stuck my finger in water and now it's softening up. Um, if I wanted to work this, I would be able to get a nice little plaster slurry out of this and I'd be able to use it again. Now, what I did was I overfilled this. Um, I did this with all of the cracks. When I ran the plaster into it. I just did it with my finger, overfilled a little, and then took this. This is a baby wipe. And this is called wet sanding. Now watch, you're going to see this disappear. Now obviously I'm not sanding. I am relying on the moisture from the baby wipe to take off bits of the plaster gradually until I am left with no more plaster than the amount that's filling the little crack on the shoulder. And if you'll notice, paint is coming off all over this baby wipe. Um, okay, here we go. All right. This spot right here is our little chip in the shoulder. And now I'm just wiping off the rest of the plaster. It's that easy. You just grab the plaster with your finger, shove it in, let it harden. And in this case, I'm just using common spackle. Comes from Home Depot. It's designed to, to patch drywall. It's nothing fancy. And there, now we're done. And now this is nice and smooth. Because all I did was wipe off the excess. It's that easy to repair these pieces. But repairing is only one part of it. It's the fun part. Now we get to paint. This is my palette, otherwise known as a paper plate. I'm using 
um, acrylic paint. They, these are water-based paints. Um, these are both heavy body paints. I'm actually not using this red. This is cadmium red. This is that same red in a soft body. But basically, it's the same paint. It's just one is thicker than the other. So, this is black, because obviously we need black. This is cadmium red. And the reason I chose cadmium red, for those of you who are not artists, because the artists already know the answer to this, when you say red to an artist, this is what comes to their minds, cadmium red. It's sort of artist's standard red. And there are just dozens of shades of red if you stop and think about it. But this one is the one artists think of when they say red. So that's what we're doing here. And this is a rose gold. Um, because as you can see, we've got a lot of gold highlights. And I chose a rose gold because I thought with all the red it would work well. So, paint, palette, oh, here. you got in the way so they can't see the drop, brush, and this is a sponge brush, and this is my water, and the cat comes over to drink this water, he really seems to enjoy it. All right, I'm wetting my little sponge brush. And I'm just going to paint. Now I am no great artist, so um, when I paint, yeah, it's kind of a sloppy little process. Here, paint, paint. Um, I have to rely on patience and perseverance to actually get anything to come of my painting. Because, as I say, no, no skill. Trust me on this. So, what I'm doing is I'm painting out all of the black areas. There's no reason why I started with black areas over, over the red, for example. Uh, just uh, there are a lot more of them, more black areas than red areas, that's all. Now, the great thing about acrylic paints is they're water soluble. So when I go through this later, after it dries, and put a second coat on, I'm going to go over it with a very thin coat. Uh, because what I will be looking to do is wipe out any possible, well, I was going to say brush marks, because that's sort of what the term is. But it's not a brush, it's a sponge. So any sponge marks, uh, any high spots, because I don't want it to look like it was hand painted. These items were painted with airbrushes, so they generally don't have any marks on them, uh, any brush marks on them, any stroke marks, any sponge marks. What they do have is a lot of overspray. If you look at this on the back, you can see that. You see how much overspray is in this area. Um, that area is supposed to be red and gold, as, as you can see from this lamp. See how convenient it is that we have those before and afters. So, you don't need to see me paint the whole thing, obviously, because you know, it's going to get very, very boring, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to paint the whole thing. Um, I estimate the black will take one coat plus a second coat of very watered down black just to smooth out any marks. The red, the red is going to take three or four light coats. Um, for one thing, I'm using a softer body paint, which means it's, it's more liquid. Um, for another, I have to cover this black overspray. And red over black is, you know, that's, that's going to take some doing. 
so I will put several light coats. Several light coats are invariably better than one heavy coat, so I will just put one after another. This paint dries very, very quickly. You can put three or four coats on in an afternoon. It's not that difficult. When I have all the black and all the red, that's when I go through with this. The ladies, I'm sure, will recognize this. This is one of those cheap sponge brushes that come with eyeshadow, and we all take them out of the eyeshadow container, and throw them away, and use good brushes instead. Well, I save mine, I toss them into a little box, and I use them for painting. I'm going to paint in, just cut in my little gold bits here and there. As I say, I am no artist. I'm just going to deal with this as best I can. I have this one to use as a model when I painted this. You can see the gold. Uh, and now I will have this one as a model when I'm painting this. And when that is all done, when everything is painted, um, I sprayed a coating of matte acrylic sealer on this. It's the kind of sealer you use, you use for um, decoupage work. And I'm glad I used matte because it's pretty darn glossy. And if I had gone with a high gloss instead, I mean, I'm sure light rays would be bouncing off this and landing on the moon. Once this is sealed, then I'm going to rewire this. When I got this socket, I got two identical sockets, two identical cords, because these are a pair, and I, I want to make sure they, they actually look like a pair and function like a pair. And when it comes to functioning like a pair, it's a little more than simple rewiring. The sockets have to be oriented the same way. There's writing on this side of the socket, uh, and which I place toward the back. When I place the socket on this lamp, I'm going to line it up the same way, the writing on the back. And the reason for that is you want a pair of lamps to operate the same way. If you push left to right and that turns one lamp on, you want to make sure that's the way the other lamp goes on too. Left to right and then right to left will turn it off. Um, it just makes your life a lot easier because you will get used to that and then you'll be fiddling around on the other lamp. So make them line up, make sure they are each functioning identically. Um, and then, this is the final thing. See this? Let me show you on this. Remember? Okay, so this is a piece of self-stick felt. And it's just going to cover the base. Let me show you what it looks like. This is the felt that's going to be used for this. This is what it looks like before I cut it. It's nine inches by 12 inches. I get these in sheets. They come in several colors, not every color in the rainbow, but I don't need every color in the rainbow. Ordinarily, I will use a lot of green, a little black. So I was $1.19 at Michael's and this backing just comes off and it's self stick. So I cut myself off a nice piece of black felt to the approximate size and when I'm ready to put it on I'm just going to trim off the corners hold it on check for size see if I need to do a little more trimming because I want it to fit the entire bottom surface but not stick out too much on the edges and that means um, let me just show oh actually show you let me let you hear this see the difference. This one is going to scar up somebody's furniture. This one is not. 
And then when these are all done, let me get this back on because I had this on before. Um, we are just going to have a nice little pair of lamps. And I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with them. I'm thinking about listing them on Etsy and sending them off to a good home. Um, I don't know. The prices for these things are, when they're in pairs, are a lot higher than you would think. And of course, my Etsy shop basically exists as a teaching tool and in order to fund our prizes and giveaways. So I don't need to charge top dollar for these. I think I can probably list them at a fairly reasonable price. I hope to move them out, take the money from that, fund more giveaways, which is something I like to do anyway. So, that's my plan. Anyway, you will get a chance to see these when they're all done. At this point, I think you know what we're doing. Um, but it does bring up the subject of when to restore antiques. These are not genuine antiques. Uh, an antique is commonly understood to be something that's more than 100 years old. Furthermore, a valuable antique or a valuable vintage item is not going to be a common, cheaply made piece like this. These might be very collectible today, but they go for high prices because they're pairs, um, and especially if they've been restored and they're in good visual condition. Yes, they do go for a lot. That does not mean they are fabulously valuable antiques. A pair of lamps like this is always going to be more valuable when they both look like this one than when they both look like this. That's something you really have to keep in mind. Sorry about that. Photo Bomb Kitty just came along and accosted the camera in the hopes of getting cuddled. So, we're back. In the case of an item like this, to restore or not restore is really a no-brainer. As you saw from the dirty baby wipes, if you touch this with wet hands, the paint was going to come off on you. That made these pieces very impractical and virtually unusable. When it's redone, and this is what the pair looks like, they are going to be functional, they are going to be attractive, like this. The condition alone makes you wonder why I would have even bought them in the first place. So, absolutely, something like this can be redone. In general, to restore or not restore is a question that, that is answered by the age of the piece the rarity of the piece, and the condition of the piece. A piece that is very rare, very valuable, it should probably be restored professionally, if at all. If it's an inexpensive, commonly mass-produced piece like these, and the condition is not good, paint's coming off, there are cracks, etc., restoring is easy. They are going to be more valuable restored than not restored. Now, 200 years from now, somebody may be cursing me saying, why did she restore these valuable pieces? But it's not 200 years from now. I'm looking at what we're doing here and now. 200 years from now, the stuff we consider disposable kitsch might be valuable antiques, who knows? But we're talking about what to do with it now. And for me, pieces like this are only valuable if they can be used. If you can put the pair of lamps on your bed table and actually reach over and touch them to turn them on in the night without getting your fingers covered in black paint, or without worrying about damage or breakage, or without, uh, without being concerned they're just going to fall apart right under your nose. When these pieces are done, when this one is done and matches this, they are going to be a nice pair 
of restored mid-century lamps. Now, they are not going to be original, but they are going to be far more valuable than they were in this condition. And that's what I need to concern myself with now. So essentially, that is the answer to should I restore, should I not restore? Are they more valuable unrestored than they would be restored? Are they, are they still useful? Do they have antique value? So that's the easy answer for this sort of thing. Always, however, be mindful that if you start to restore something, and you screw it up, you could be damaging a valuable piece. These are an easy restoration. Plaster is very easy to repair. All you need is paint. Uh, I'd love to see what a real artist could do with pieces like this. And we have a lot of artists among our viewers. So please, you start critiquing my paint job, do be kind. I am not an artist and I am not pretending to be. I have no doubt that someone with skill could do a better job. On the other hand, even my poor skill is better than what they were doing with the airbrush when this first came off the, uh, off the factory assembly line. So I can feel good about that. So that's what we've got going for this week. So until next time, you guys have a fabulous week and I will see you soon.